Welcome to the History Lord. You join us here today, we're outside the Royal Albert Hall, but we're actually looking at this memorial behind me today. This is the memorial to the Great Exhibition of 1851. The Great Exhibition? What was that I hear you ask? Well, let's find out all about it, shall we? Welcome to London. It's Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's Prince Consort, who has been widely credited with being the driving force behind the Great Exhibition. But I think some of that praise should be bestowed upon Henry Cole. At the time, his day job was as an assistant record keeper at the Public Records Office. But he had lots of outside interests too, including editing and publishing journals. Henry's major passion seems to have been industry and the arts. And he combined both of these as editor of a journal called the Journal of Design. This publication encouraged artists to apply their designs to everyday articles which could then be mass produced and sold. It was in 1846 in his role as a council member for the Society of Arts that Henry Cole was introduced to Prince Albert. It wasn't long after this until the Society received the Royal Charter which changed its name to the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce. Initially, there seemed to be little interest in a concept of an exhibition by the government of the day. But undeterred, Henry and Prince Albert continued to develop their idea. They wanted it to be for all nations and a great collection of art in industry. With increased public pressure, the government reluctantly set up a royal commission to investigate the idea of a great exhibition. A competition was organised to design a building that would not only be large enough, but would also be of sufficient grandeur to house such an event. The eventual winners of the contract were Fox and Henderson, and they submitted plans that were designed by Joseph Paxton. Paxton himself had designed a wonderful glass and iron conservatory at Chatsworth's house, which was the seat of the Duke of Devonshire. Then there was the issue of a suitable venue. That's when the Duke of Wellington backed an idea that Hyde Park should be that venue. The designs were impressive. They were glass and iron conservatory, a crystal palace as it would become popularly known as. But it's amended to accommodate the rather large elm trees that were already in the park. Around about 5,000 workmen strived to erect the 1,850 feet long, 108 feet high structure. The work was completed on time and on budget and the great exhibition opened on the 1st of May, 1851 by the Queen herself, Queen Victoria. The exhibition itself in 1851 had all of the elements of Victorian society. There was porcelain, there was glassware, there was ironworks on display, there was even the Koh-i-Noor diamond. There was around about 100,000 exhibits, all from over the British Empire as it was known at the time. Huge crowds started to gather at the Crystal Palace because it coincided with the expansion of the railways, especially the railways into London. The exhibition ran from May to October of 1851, and during that short time, over six million people passed through the crystal doors. The event proved to be one of the most successful ever staged and became one of the defining points of the Victorian era. The organizers knew it was going to be self-financing, but were even more thrilled when a profit was turned. It was enough for Henry Cole to realize his dream of a complex of museums in South Kensington. These museums are still there today, the Science, Natural History, and Victoria and Albert Museums. There was also money left over to fund the Imperial College of Science, the Royal Colleges of Art, Music and Organists, and don't forget, there was also enough to fund the Royal Albert Hall as well. The Crystal Palace itself was dismantled, and the clever design not only allowed it to be built quickly, but also dismantled quickly too. And after so short an exhibition, the whole structure was removed from Hyde Park and it re-erected in Sydenham, South East London, then a sleepy hamlet in the Kent countryside. Sadly, the future for the Crystal Palace atop Sydenham Hill was not a very happy one. After being put to a variety of uses over the years, the building was finally destroyed by a fire on the 30th of November, 1936. It said the flames lit up the night sky and were visible for miles all over London. Sadly, all that's left at the old Crystal Palace now is a little bit of the foundations and a few stumps. A sad end to such a grand building. Thank you very much for watching. We do hope you enjoy these videos. And if you do, please hit subscribe. 
If you want to know when videos are uploaded, there's a notification bell just down below. And if you want to see what we do outside of these videos, please go to historylord.co.uk, see about the walking tour of London, or have a look down below and see about James's YouTube channel, which is called Last Line Films. Thanks for watching. I make it dinner time, don't you, James? <laughs>